Okay, it's seven. Let's get started. So welcome. This is the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society's talk. Uh, we're going to be having a talk on the 50th anniversary of the CNPS Rare Plant Inventory by Aaron Sims, who is the director of uh, the Rare Plant Program at CNPS. I am Vivian New. I am one of our chapter's co-presidents. And I'm also joined tonight by Judy Fennerty, but I have a slide on that, so I'm going to move forward. Before I do anything else, though, I wanted to acknowledge that the work done by the Santa Clara Valley chapter of CNPS lies in the homeland of the Amamutsen tribal band, the Tamian Nation, the Rumayatush Ohlone, and the Muwekma Ohlone, who still live and thrive in this area today. We hope to learn from them and support their work to restore traditional practices and heal from historical trauma. If this is your first talk, we would love to know how you found out about us and where you are. So if you don't mind sharing that in chat, we'd love to hear from you or read from you. And our talks are always done by a team. Um, tonight I'm hosting and I'm also taking care of the technology in the background. Uh, Judy Fennerty is joining me and she's going to be taking care of QA and chat. So we do ask that during the talk, you are welcome to ask questions, but please type them into chat. Judy will be watching and that she will be asking questions of Aaron at the appropriate time. And our speaker tonight, as I mentioned before, is Aaron Sim. If you're not familiar with CNPS, we are a nonprofit environmental organization. We were founded in 1965. We have over 12,000 members in 36 chapters that are spread not only all over California, but also beyond not just the state, but the country, because we have a chapter in Baja, California. Our chapter is the Santa Clara Valley chapter, which covers all of San Santa Clara County, as well as Southern San Mateo County. Our mission is to protect California's native plants and their natural habitats today and into the future. We do that through science, education, stewardship, gardening, and advocacy. If you're not currently a CNPS member, we would love to have you join us. Your money helps to support our movement to conserve California's native plant diversity. And once you are a member, you get not just one, but two journals. Artemisia is our scientific journal, lots of really interesting articles. And then we have Flora, which is more general interest topics, a lot of gardening, um, as well as just other general interest uh, articles. You'll also receive our Blazing Star chapter newsletter, which tells you what's going on in our chapter and also has informational articles as well. And you get discounts at participating local nurseries. There's other things as well. Very, very easy to join. Either point your, at yourself at the QR code or just go to cnps.org slash join and you can sign up online. As I was mentioning before the talk start, or the, we started, we have a lot of events going on in February. This weekend, on Saturday, there are actually three different restoration activities you could choose from. Edgewood Park up in Redwood City. There's one going, actually, that one's on Friday. Um, and then there's also habitat restoration at Lake Cunningham, that's in San Jose, and another habitat restoration at Cataldi Park, also on Saturday. Uh, both Edgewood and, and Lake Cunningham are weekly events and you can find out more about them on our website. We also have a Durka walk scheduled on Saturday. I think it is currently full right now, but you can still get on the waiting list and it's quite possible you'll get in because we usually have a lot of dropouts right at the end. Uh, we have a photo group which meets every month on Zoom. If you're a photographer or if you just like to look at pretty pictures of plants, you're welcome to join and you can find out how to do that on our website. It is very important. It's a really great way to end up your week just looking at some pretty pictures and sharing pictures if you're a photographer. Uh, we've also restarted our native plant ID program that used to be called King with Natives and that will be meeting in person at the Peninsula Conservation Center on the, the fourth Tuesday of every month. So our next meeting is going to be on February 27th, 7 o'clock. More information available on our website, which is cnps-scb.org, also on Meetup. Um, there's QR codes for both of those places, and there's also an announcement on our chapter news mailing list, which I will tell you about shortly, like right now. Um, so if you would like to get a weekly message just to tell you what's coming up uh, with our chapter, 
it's very easy to do that. You just subscribe to this Google group, which is very long and here on the screen. Um, but you can also go to cnps-scp.org and there's information on the website explaining how to do that. So before we get started on the talk, I just wanted to remind everyone to please mute your microphones. As I mentioned before, Judy is going to be watching for questions in the chat. So you can ask a question at any point in time as long as you type it into chat rather than trying to, to speak it out loud. Um, we will be asking Aaron all the questions as appropriate during his talk, and we do expect to finish no later than 9 p.m. Um, this program is both on YouTube and on Zoom. Um, on YouTube, you can, if you want to go back and look at it later, or if you know you have a friend who wants to hear about to see it, it will be available for viewing on YouTube immediately. Whoops, went a little bit too far. Vivian, we have a question about whether the um, plan ID class would be a continuation of the la the first one we had or similar. I think it's it's a it's going to be a little bit different. Um, it's not just a lecture like last time. It's it's more hands on. So we are encouraging people to bring in plant samples, and there there will be a little bit of talk at the beginning, and then more, it'll be more interactive than that first one. Okay, well, I wanted to welcome everybody to our talk about the 50th anniversary of the CNPS rare plant inventory. I'm going to let Aaron tell you about the inventory, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Aaron. He has been interested in the outdoors and nature since he was a little kid. He, he was interested in animals as well as plants, but in college, he took a field class from David Keel in 2005, and basically he fell in love with plants and he really started focusing on them and he spent five years TAing before making this his career. He has been involved with our rare plant program for a really long time and now he's been in charge of the rare plant inventory, which is one of the core things that CNPS does and it's a really valuable uh, tool. And I am now going to turn it over to Aaron to tell you all about it. So thank you, Aaron, for being here, and you are on. Thank you very much, Vivian. Thank you for inviting me. Um, as Vivian said, I'm Aaron Sims. I've been working with CNPS since 2010. I am speaking to you tonight from Northern Wintu lands, and we also have lands of the Hoopa and Yurok tribes. Um, living around the Weaverville area. I'm in the kind of north center of Trinity County up here, and I've lived here for, oh gosh, about 10 years now, um, even while working for CNPS. And I am so excited to talk to you all about the rare plant inventory and the history of it and where it's, uh, where it's at today. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to get started here and um, see about sharing my screen and getting into this. Let's see here. There's the button. Now I got to find one here. Okay. Well, thanks again. Um, so as many of you know, CMPS is a lot of, there's a lot of parts and programs of CMPS. Um, here's just a snapshot of our major programs. We have the conservation program, education and gardening, which includes horticulture, our publications program, which develops the new flora articles, as well as Artemisia and um, all of our social media as well. Um, and then we have the plant science programs, a rare plant program and vegetation. And tonight I'm gonna focus on the 50th anniversary of the rare plant inventory. This is our new landing site that Lee O'Keefe, our public affairs director, developed for us. It's a really beautiful um, capture of the 50 years of this inventory. Um, tonight, I'm going to be using QR codes in my talk. I do, it's a little funky because I usually give presentations in person and you can take a photo with your phone. You can still do that um, if you just hold it up to your monitor. Um, and you don't have to worry about trying to get to that connection right away. You can just snap a quick photo. And then within that photo, um, you should be able to go in and, and link to the QR code. 
So if I go too quick, let me know too, and I can go back and, and let you get a snapshot of that. I'm gonna start my presentation, about half of my presentation is gonna go through a timeline of the rare plant inventory. And then I'm gonna talk about um, a little bit about the tracking, how we track rare plants and how many rare plants there are in the state of California through this work. Um, and then uh, towards the latter half of my presentation, I'm going to give you a live demo of the rare plant inventory online and kind of show you around and how to navigate that website um, in its current edition. And I'm going to give you a little bit of highlights for some of the plants that were recently added to the inventory that occur in the Santa Clara uh, Valley chapter of CMPS. So um, a little bit of those highlights through the online inventory and what to look for. And then I'll end by talking about why we should conserve rare species. Um, it's surprising to me, but I still get the question of like, why Why should we care? And I think a lot of you probably know, but um, I always wanna emphasize the importance as well. The timeline of the inventory and events. And as I go through this, um, I want to highlight some of the major figures that helped um, develop the online inventory or develop the original inventory into what it is today. Um, but I know I can't include everyone, so I'm going to be leaving out a lot of other key figures. And there's just too many people to mention um, that have helped develop this work and get us where we are today. So I'm going to go through 65 when we were founded to the 2000s. In 1965, CNPS was founded with nearly uh, nearly 60 years ago now. So we're working on an anniversary next year for, for CNPS of 60 years. Um, it was founded to protect the Tilden Botanic Garden in the Bay Area. And so it's kind of started as this conservation organization. Um, the, the logo you see here is Panamint Daisy. And it doesn't quite do it justice. This is a really like a meter tall you know, about three and a half feet tall um, daisy that occurs in the Panamint Mountains and and, des and desert valleys of of um, Mojave Desert. Um, I recommend anyone that hasn't seen it to look up photos online. I meant to include some in my presentation, but it is really this prolific, massive uh, flower. So just wanted to let you all know that. And um, it is the the rare plant and the highlight of our of our logo. So only three years later, after CMPS was founded, um, then president, Dr. Ledyard Stebbins, who was a famous geneticist out of UC Davis, he fa really founded the rare plant program. And he realized that there, there was this problem that there was no list of rare plants being generated for the state. Um, and so he began compiling that list. And he used um, Munza's flora to look at plants that had distribution of within or less than 100 mile um, 100 mile diameter circle around those plants. This first list was indexed in these five by eight cards and he distributed it to Jack Major who's at UC Davis and a bunch of others at, um, at UC Davis and Cal Academy um, to get more information about these plants. And at one point he enlisted um, Roman Gankin, who was at UC Davis Arboretum at the time, to distribute the, the documents for additional information and research. So Gankin was another big figure in the start of this. And it sounds like from what I could read is that um, Stebbins was really good at kind of enlisting people for help and getting this thing started, but he, he really worked uh, with a lot of people at his community to get more information. But then only a couple years later, a lot of policy came through for California. Um, at the national level, the Environmental Policy Act was um, initiated in 69, but actually was enacted in 1970. The California Endangered Species Act came about, as well as the California Environmental Quality Act, which is the strongest legislation for rare plants in the state of California. And this is all coming together when Ledyard had started this list. And so it's really highly valuable and kind of feeds into these into this legislation, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. In 71, 
the first official unpublished edition of the inventory was developed and it contained 526 plants. Um, it was actually, um, it required further research and review for verification, but it was a great start. And it was based on those um, index cards that Ledyard Stebbins had started. It was actually typed up um, and distributed by Robin Gankin um, based on Stebbins' initial work. And then at one point in 1971, Gankin moved to Maryland for a while and enlisted, in, enlisted Robert or Bob Powell at UC Davis to take over management of the rare plant records. Um, so it's really a lot of passing off here and, and so forth as people needed to get other work done. And, and they were all doing this in addition to their full-time jobs of professorship and research um, and being mentors and all this time, they were doing this as like on a, as a side work just to get this going. So the first real list developed in 1971 and in 73, the Federal Endangered Species Act came around. And this is also a time when the first edition of the inventory, which was published in 74, really nears the finish line. I'm going to go through a few of the highlights of kind of the work that happened at this time. And it, I spent the last few days reading about a lot of this history in our in the CNPS journal Fermantia, which is now titled Artemisia. Um, and it was really fascinating to learn how quickly all of this really came together. It's amazing how much work came about in just this last year even. So there was some funding to really push it through the finish line and I wanted to, uh, to highlight this. Um, the draft plant list was a really great start. It was lacking a lot of scientific rigor and ver verifiable up-to-date data. So it was developed by these scientists and professors and passed around in the academic arena mostly, um, but they didn't have a lot of on the ground data to back it up, and they didn't have a lot of other uh, sources and material to really justify the rarity of these plants. So it really required herbarium review, a lot of mapping, and also field verification. Um, Les Hood at the time in 1972 was the CNPS conservation chairman and discovered that there was state funding from the Office of Planning and Research for a program to gather information about areas of environmental concern. Um, this kind of stimulates my mind to think of the important plant areas that CMPS has been recently working on in the past several years, um, which has also been afforded state funding to get developed. Um, and at this time, they had a proposal of $25,000, which was awarded later in 1973. And then if you bear with me here, I'm going to move this. I don't know if you guys can see this thing on there. The CMPS board had also already previously approved $2,000. So it was already underway and they were just waiting for this additional $25,000 to keep things moving along and really get it going. Let's see. Bob Schlissing or Schleising of the Chico State was hired to research Southern California herbaria. So they're actually getting into the herbaria and looking at specimen labels of vouchered plants and the labels indicate where the plant was collected. So they used that to determine how many records the plant had on the, you know, how many observations and collections it had to try to determine its actual rarity. Um, and at the time that was really the only way to do it. There was no iNaturalist or CalFlora or these email communications and pocket phones and everything else to really document this. So they had to get into the herbaria to get this information. Wayne Savage of San Jose State and Dean Taylor, who's a student at UC Davis at the time, began to look at Northern California herbaria and traveling around and getting specimens on lobe. Um, Bob Powell's title at this time was changed to the director of the Rare Plant Project. And um, he mentions in this article that I'm referencing here, this 1973 article by, by Bob, that um, he was in a essentially in a committee of one at that time. Um, John Sawyer, the president of CNPS at that time, who was on the North Coast, a really good botanist that also um, helped develop the inventory, um, appointed an advisory committee that consisted of Les Hood, Alice, Alice Howard, Larry Heckard of UC Berkeley um, to really help get this research going. The Office of Planning and Research furnished a set of about 1800 topographic maps, physical maps, to provide to the program. And 
to my astonishment, there was approximately 10,000 35 millimeter photographs of the herbarium vouchers that were then collected and passed around to get this information going. So um, that's a huge undertaking just within this year. Thousands of specimens were examined and in large part, they also need to be keyed out. So not only just looking at them and looking at the labels, but they had to determine if these were actually the rare plants that were in question of being rare. Um, so once these photographs were gathered and specimens were examined, examined um, there was a great pile of photos and maps that were bundled up by areas and they were given to botanists or lay botanists to go out into the field and verify and plot the plants on the maps. And in 1973, um, still going on, getting this going, um, Roman Gankin held what they called a map in, uh, in, in the middle and late July. And it's noted that it was probably the first of its kind anywhere in the United States. There was about 40 professional and lay botanists that met on the UC Davis campus. Um, apparently there was TV coverage, Les Hood, who is the conservation chair and John Sawyer, who's the president of CMPS at the time, held a press conference. Um, and they went through the list and they stayed up till the, the official uh, records indicate that they were up till 10 p.m. every night, but there was people that took maps with them and still worked throughout the night. Um, and they were working to establish these plants on that initial list of 526 plants into categories of not rare to probably extinct um, and to really you know, work through that list, checking all the data, verifying every record, um, mapping individual localities from each plant record and so forth. It sounds like quite an event. And in 1973, the Endangered Species Act was enacted, as I mentioned earlier, and they directed the secretary of the Smithsonian Institute to compile a list of threatened and endangered species in the US. And of course, the 1971 list was included um, at the time, Bob Powell said that he believes there was four other states that had lists, but none of them were ex nearly extensive um, as far as the history and review of the CMPS list. So California really, they really had it going on in, in providing this baseline information for the federal ESA. And Powell and others were participate to it in the workshop for the nat reviewing the national list and making recommended changes. This was all happening in one year here. So there we have Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA administer the Federal Endangered Species Act. That's why these uh, seals are, mentioned, are up here. But then finally, in December of 1974, the first edition of the inventory was, was in print and published, and it contained nearly 1,400 rare plants. And I wanted to go through a um, a quote here from Bob Bob Powell about the uh, the inventory upon its publication. He mentions will, now that this is published, it will be up to the society members to see to it that the information provided to local governments is incorporated into planning at local levels. Realistically, we're not going to win all the battles of rare plants versus other land uses. I say this because we can get overzealous in protecting every single population of a particular species. However, we definitely cannot afford the other extreme. I'm concerned about mine if my neighbor has some. Now, several years passed um, with the keeping up and maintaining the list of, of rare plants and working on future publications. Um, in 1974, the Nature Conservancy started to develop the Heritage Program for California. So the Conservancy had been going to state by state to start these heritage programs for the whole nation. And in this year, 79, they came to California and they were based out of Sac State campus. And this is important because it helped establish the California Natural Diversity Database, which some of you may be familiar with, or some of you definitely are familiar with today which houses all of our rare plant records uh, for the state. And at this time, it was a momentous occasion where CNPS shared all of those maps and all of the location details and all of the rare plant records that they had on file with the Natural Diversity Database. 
Um, it was obvious when TNC got here and started this heritage uh, program for California that CNPS was really the one that housed all this data and that had really gathered it all and was the, the leader in rare plant information for the state. And so it just made sense for CNPS to work with them and share all the data that we had. The amount of information being gathered and maintained for the rare plant list became, continued to become insurmountable. And so in 1980, CNPS hired its first full-time botanist, Rick York. I believe this was the first full-time paid position of CNPS um, and has continued since that time. Um, at that time in 1980, the second edition was also published. This was by, um, edited by Smith, Cole, and Sawyer. Have a error slide. In 81, the diversity database was transferred into state government via Assembly Bill 1, uh, 1039. And so now it was officially established and transferred to state government. At this time, Rick York was working with the department on updating, maintaining the rare plant lists and really working collaboratively. Um, so much so that in 1982, CNPS and the Department of Fish and Game, then Fish and Game, now Fish and Wildlife, signed a memorandum of understanding to have co-located staff and to help share resources of all rare plant data and information. So uh, how many of you have, are aware that CNPS has been working with the state government agency so closely since this time? Does anyone? Oh, good. It's good to see some hands come up. So I really wanted to share this and it's, um, it's really interesting because it's it's a really unique situation for a nonprofit, especially a um, conservation focused, advocacy focused nonprofit organization to work with a government agency that also has different branch that um, that develops uh, you know the the state's um, endangered species lists and works on policy and everything else. So this memorandum of understanding was updated or in 19, I think the last update was around 2000 and it hasn't changed since that time. And it's it's generally um, pretty, pretty run of the mill and basic as far as just, we must share data across the board. So it provides the natural um, diversity database, the rare find application and BIOS and the monthly download of all the rare plant information from the state to uh, CNPS members that are specifically working in non uh, nonprofit rare plant conservation work. And so this is shared out with our rare plant chairs primarily and our, rare, and our conservation chairs of the organization. It's normally a $600 a year subscription, something around there. There's a lot of other advantages to having this um, this relationship other than just data sharing too. Um, one of the uh, one of the focus on Roxanne Bittman for a minute. She was hired in 1986 and became the botanist for the National Diversity Database at that time. Um, Roxanne was really instrumental in really training and mentoring the rare plant botanist throughout her time. She worked for the department for 30 years or so. She's actually re retired, but has been hired again to work on um, status rankings for the Natural Heritage Program. And a lot of the past botanists in rare plant, the rare plant program had a stint of anywhere from one to six years. Um, Dave Tibor was one of the longest botanists. He was around for 10 or 11 years. Myself, uh, one of the longest, uh, been here since 2010, um, but have now passed that baton on to Ellen Dean in the Rare Plant Program to facilitate this work. But without Roxanne Bittman being there as a mentor and really um, keeping the consistency and how our relationship work and training the incumbent botanist has really been ins insurmountable um, to have that consistency of knowledge um, with the program you know, more than any other rare plant botanist because she had been there for so long. So Roxanne was on the hiring committee when I started, uh, applied for CNPS. Um, 
I found it very odd that uh, I I went into this panel interview and here was one of the third one of the three panelists was a state employee, and then little did I know I'd be working in a, the state office of the Department of Fish and Wildlife in downtown Sacramento instead of the CNPS office on K Street. But that's just how it goes. That's how uh, the rare plant botanist you know works within that office of the department, and um, it's pretty neat. From 1984 to 2001, a lot of work went underway to develop four more print editions of the inventory. So in just a little more than se or seven years or so, um, these four editions came out. And this is, uh, I, I want to get a high resolution of this is Mark uh, Skinner, the rare plant botanist, uh, when that fifth edition got published. And it was accompanied by the electronic inventory, which had been going for a few years prior. Um, Mark and others released this computer publication of the inventory that replaced the print volume as far as being most up to date. And this was developed into compact disks that were sent out to agencies and anybody of interest to get information about rare plants to have the most up to date info. And um, Bruce Pavlik, who was the vice president at that time, claimed that um, it was one of the most sophisticated natural heritage and inventory software programs in the world. And from what I could tell, it really was. The inventory um, in of itself that was put in um, into existence by, by Bob Powell, he was actually computerizing those files back in the 70s when there was those massive computers that were like bigger than my HVAC system outside, they're just these huge towers. Um, and it was actually, you know, those first computers that he was working with at UC Davis um, that started all of this. And it kept, went from there into more modern computers and um, able to develop it into this, into this software. So it was really interesting to, you know, it's really interesting to learn that like how cutting edge a nonprofit uh, of CNPS, you know, really was able to get this work done with with just the amount of people volunteering and donations and support. In 1999 to 2001, Nature Serve was formed out of TNC. The Nature Conservancy at that time was shifting over towards land acquisition for conservation and left its heritage programs into the Nature Serve program. And then in the 2000s, the online inventory came about and internet-based reviews came up. Many of you likely know Larry Levine. He's a North Coast chapter uh, member and delegate for many, many years. He's a current CMPS board member. He was actually the one that developed the first online inventory in 2001, and he had no formal training or programming uh, at all. He just found some free academic software developed in Slovenia, Slovenia and that he discovered through an internet search and just created it. Um, there was a high need, you know, there was a, a lot of work to produce the electronic inventory CDs and to distribute that and disseminate that information. Um, Larry made it all free publicly available in the online inventory um, and it was updated quarterly. So there was no longer any print editions taking several years. Um, the new editions would be refreshed online every quarter of the year. This was also a time in 2005 where Misa uh, Ward, the rare plant botanist at the time, along with David Tibor, as he was on his way out of, um, of working as a rare plant botanist, started to develop this online status review forum. And it's still in use today. Um, here's a QR code that'll take you to a sign up form. If you're not already involved, um, you don't have to be a professional botanist to do this. Um, it is pretty nerdy, I will admit. Um, we work on these dot, these publications of, of rare plant status reviews, and we send them out to these different regions throughout the state where the rare plants are known to occur. And at the same time, they get posted on this online forum. And it's a place where everyone can weigh in or at least review and know about these upcoming status changes and additions to the online inventory. Um, it's a nice place to nerd out. And if you want to be involved or just aware of what's happening, I encourage you to sign up. Um, and get involved.
So here we are, some more to talk about in the 2000s. We have Greg Suba hired as the first um, conservation program director, at least full time. There was a lot of people that held um, conservation chair positions in the past and, and throughout current time too, as, uh, in different chapters that have been hired part time and so forth. Um, but this was very uh, important because it allowed a full time employee to focus just on conservation. In the past, it was really, um, I don't know how they did it, honestly. Nick Jensen was the botanist before myself. He was the rare plant botanist in 2007 to 2010. And he did a lot of conservation work. He did a lot of, uh, it was a time when a lot of desert renewable energy, uh, solar energy projects were coming up and he worked diligently to help um, bring awareness and bring protections to rare plants that occurred in those areas as well as many other areas throughout the state. And while also doing this status review process and updating and maintaining the inventory, um, with the hiring of a, of a full-time director in, in conservation, it allowed that the rare plant botanist myself to um, to free up that time to really focus on the inventory. And it's also um, you know, kind of important to not have an advocacy um, stint as far as doing scientific review and rigor. Um, there's kind of a, a misnomer for doing the, the conservation and advocacy side of things when you're also reviewing and ranking the rare plants for the state. And in 2010, the online eight inventory eighth edition came about and this replaced the 2001 seventh edition that Larry Levine created. Um, it was a complete redesigned interface. It had a whole new advanced search ability to search on nine quads and a bunch of other um, new tools but it still used the, the same underlying database. And what that meant is that it was only updated every month, um, but that's still better than quarterly. So I'm gonna leave this timeline now with a few quotes from James Payne Smith, who is the president of CNPS in the past. He was the first chairman of the Rare Plant Scientific Advisory Committee. Um, he's a senior editor of the second, third, and fourth editions of the CMPS inventory and was named a fellow of CMPS in 1995. And these um, these really stuck with me uh, from a, an article that he wrote in Fremontia in 1987 titled California Leader in Endangered Plant Protection. And um, what he says in this article really is, I can't say it better myself um, as far as what the program does and what the work in, uh, means for, for conservation. The data are a means for accomplishing one of the society's major goals, the preservation of rare plants and their habitats. CNPS's responsibilities are best served by complete and accurate information upon which to make sound judgments and recommendations for the protection of native plants. He goes on to say that it has become axiomatic to say that if you want to save rare plants, you must save their habitats, a generality that some experts believe should be examined more critically. Saving specific areas has always been one of the society's principal efforts. Many names come to mind, Vine Hill, Butterfly Valley, Huckleberry Trail, the Lamphere Christ Christensen Dunes, Ring Mountain, Ione, San Bruno Mountain, San Luis Island, Fort Ord, the Presidio of San Francisco, the Napomo Dunes, and adding to this now, Moluk Loyuk. Um, this was written in 1987. So think about all the other areas that CNPS has helped protect. And it just brings tears to my eyes. Nearly. <laughs> and lastly, the, the successes, especially at the chapter level, in working out conservation assessments, fashioning mitigation plans, affecting the language and local coastal plans, have all benefited from our database of rare plant information. And this is just to emphasize that we couldn't do this without the chapters. They act as hubs throughout the state to really inform the rare plant inventory and to help develop these ranks. And in turn, we provide this data back to the chapters to help conserve rare unique places. So now on to here is the um, you know, the final of that timeline. The print editions are all available online. Um, if you follow this QR code here, you can get to the six print editions. And the current online inventory is at rareplants.cnps.org. And I'll be giving you a tour momentarily here about that. 
see how I'm doing on time here. All right. I'm going to talk a little bit about tracking. Before I give you an overview of the inventory online, I'm going to give you a little about tracking rare plants. Um, and just a, a snapshot into the conservation of rare plants in California because of this work. So here are the ranks. I'd be remiss to not include these in every presentation I give. Um, there are six categories to define rarity in the rare plant inventory. Um, it, the list originally started out uh, back in that 1971 list was really divided into rare plants and not so rare plants. Um, but since that time, it's developed into these six uh, more refined buckets of, of rarity and endangerment. So fortunately, our smallest list is the 1A and 2A list that, that in, indicate um, extinction or extirpation. Um, there's currently 21 plants that are presumed extinct in California on the 1A list. And the 1B category is our largest category. This includes over 1,200 rare plants, and they're endangered in the state and elsewhere. A lot of these plants are endemic to the state, meaning they only occur in California. However, um, they don't have to be. They're just rare globally. So they could occur um, in, in other states or in different nations even, but um, they are rare throughout their entire known distributions. 2A is a category that was created in 2013, um, really developed from the Rare Plant Program Committee. Uh, they noticed that there were plants on the extirpated list that actually were common outside of the state. So extirpated in California, but common elsewhere uh, was developed and there's five plants on that list. The 2B category is endangered in California, but common elsewhere. Um, this list can be confusing to some because globally they're not considered for protection. So some federal agencies may not recognize um, these plants as significant for protections or conservation, but California does. And the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, can help protect these plants um, within the confines of our political boundary. Um, it's also important to note that while some of these plants are common, could be very abundant outside of the state, there has been some studies that indicate that plants along the in the peripheral of their range, so, um, so say we have a plant that's really common in Nevada, in Nevada deserts, but it's only eking out marginally into California, um, these plants on the very periphery, especially if there's a, a disjunction in their range, um, have a tendency to undergo unique speciation or can and become be evolving into something different. And with that, their genes mutate and they can be hopefully um, and potentially um, more uh, or less susceptible to climate shifts such as uh, global warming and um, severe weather changes. Um, and other events. You could also consider it um, if there was a blight that could occur in that core population, these peripheral populations have, if they are um, isolated, they have the tendency maybe to survive the, that type of situation and so forth. So they are really important to conserve um, in those ways. We have a list three for plants that are taxonomically problematic. These plants aren't um, sure whether they're, well, people aren't sure whether they're valid or not, whether they're unique taxa or not. Um, and so a lot of these plants we're working on now, um, if they are to become taxonomically valid and accepted and uh, validly accepted in the botanical community and, and, and so forth, they are highly rare and endangered. But if not, they should be removed from the list. Um, they're likely these other common plants that, that don't need priority for protections. And then we have our watch list category, which is um, just over 600 plants. And these are uncommon in the state. They're, they could occur um, commonly outside of the state as well, or they could be rare and only occur in California um, or uncommon in California. Um, they tend to be only around 50 to 100 occurrences in the state. So there you have it. If I was in person, I'd be asking you guys, I'd be quizzing you about this later, but I'm just going to keep going. Um, this is a rarity, hotspot of rarity and richness for the United States developed by the Nature Conservancy um, and NatureServe. And it's a rarity weighted richest in, um, index based on plants and animals. 
in the databases and it just shows how many uh, is, are weighted, how much rarity is weighted in the state of California. California is one of 36 biodiversity hotspots. 35% of the native flora is endemic. So that's over 2,300 plants that occur nowhere else in the world but California. Um, and here you have, um, I hope you can see my mouse. I don't know if you can see my mouse. But here you, on the left axis, uh, you can see California is here surpassing all other states in the nation with its number of native taxa. So it has over, the state currently has over 6,600 native plants. We can we can see your mouse, by the oh, way. Oh, Loop, good. Blob. Loop, loop. Good, yeah, I, try, I got this blob so you can follow along, hopefully. Um, and here's all the other states. And so if you look at the California rare plants, California has more rare plants than most states just have native plants, which is pretty astounding. So um, yeah, just to show, <laughs> highly diverse. And the reasons for this are, are many. Um, I have a whole other talk about that. So I'm not really going to get into the, the reasons for, for so much rare plants in, in California, but there are, um, are verifiable reasons for it. So I mentioned earlier the California Natural Diversity Database, and here's what the rare plants uh, look like when they're plotted on a map from that database. Um, there's 1,354 rare plants that only occur in California, nowhere else in the world. So nearly over half of the endemic plants are also rare. Um, and there's over 46,000 occurrence records reported, and these are for the one and two plants, the plants that are rare in California and elsewhere, and the plants that are rare in California but common elsewhere. Those are the ones that are primarily mapped by the Natural Diversity Database. And we look at the percentages here, um, over one third of the native flora is rare, threatened, or endangered. So here are the, the numbers. And while we have so many rare plants ranked in the inventory, there's only 286 plants in California that are state and or federally listed. So this means there's over 2,300 here that have no federal or state protections under the Endangered Species Acts. But this is where CNPS and the Environmental Quality Acts kicks in here. So while they're not officially state listed under the Endangered Species Acts. Um, there are the over 1,700 plants that are in these 1A and 2, 1A, 1B, 2B categories that meet qualifications under CEQA 15380, which is the California Environmental Quality Act, that gain protections through this legislation. Um, the CNPS list is not in of itself a regulatory list like the Endangered Species Acts are, but through CEQA, it shows that they meet the criteria and they need to be considered as such uh, when reviewing and implementing projects. And there's another 680 or so plants that are on the CRPR three or four category that may meet, may meet these definitions and may be protected um, and treated as an equivalency process, if you will. So these can be fought for for protection, but aren't as, um, aren't as regular, rigorously protected as, as the 1,700 rare plants. So this means that of 2,100 plants, over 2,100 plants may not otherwise demonstrably receive protection in California if it weren't for the CMPS inventory in the ranking and review. So 88% of all of our rare plants in the state are really given this protection through the rare plant program's work and ranking them and developing this inventory. Um, and it includes, um, if you look at the entire native flora, that's 33% that is protected through CEQA um, based on this inventory of rare and endangered plants. Here's what conservation for rare plants might look like, or does look like rather with rare plant ranks and the California Environment Equality Act. So these are all of the dots of rare plant occurrences throughout the state of California. Um, it's made up of 42,416 records of the 1B and 2B plants. And on the right here, you see just the occurrences of the officially listed state and federally listed plants and or federally listed plants in California. 
So it gives you an idea of areas that can be protected because of the rare plants that occur there. Um, and also, you know, highlighting how many rare plants and, and areas need to be protected um, in the state for these rare plants and to, to keep them from going extinct. So here are the ranks again. And I'm not going to spend more time on these, but you can look up further information online if you care to find out or just message me. And I mentioned the Natural Diversity Database throughout this talk already, um, how we started to work together in 1980 um, and how we got an MOU with the state in 82. The Diversity Database and CMPS work together to rank plants. If you follow this uh, link or this QR code, um, there's a, a website page that tells you more information. Within that, there's a PDF document that links to about the collaborative relationship with CNPS and the CNDB. And I really recommend you read it. It might be, I um, hope it's not too dry, but it does go through a lot of the information about how we work together and the importance and the ranking process. So if you're in more inclined to find out about how we rank plants, take a look. The major differences between the NDDB um, and CNPS is that the National Diversity Database independently assigns and reassigns the global and state heritage ranks. Um, these are called G and S ranks. You might have seen like G1, S2, and so forth. Um, so they really do that independently using a ranking calculator, while at the same time, CNPS initiates the research and development of status review documents and the process of ca ranking California plants into the inventory. Um, I will say that in California, there's this unique, um, because of this unique relationship and the work that we do, um, the NDDB doesn't assign newly, doesn't add plants for state rankings in California without them first going through the rare plant inventory review process. Um, so CNPS really is, um, you know, the, the ground level of getting these plants reviewed and assessed and added to these lists. We review a lot of factors. I'm not gonna go through all of these, um, but the major you know, factors are looking at rarity trends and threats. And um, there are definitions for these that I'm not gonna go into, but there's a lot of more technical jargon and information that I can share with you later if you're interested. Um, with this said, a lot of this information is lacking for rare plants, especially when we're initiating a new review of them. And so this is where, you know, our process is really heavily involves outreach and communication and working with agencies and institutions and lay botanists and professional botanists and consultants and everyone that might have an interest, people on iNaturalist that are taking photos, people on CalFlora that are taking photos and documenting plants, um, you name it, any and all information is good and we take it and assimilate it and fact check and do and so forth. Um, we couldn't do it without the CMPS chapters and all of the um, the specialists and the lay people getting out to look at rare plants and, and everything else. Um, here we have Dave Keel, uh, one of my mentors who, who Vivian mentioned in the beginning, and he's holding up a thistle. I refer to Dave as the thistle king or aster king because he's um, written the uh, key to Asteraceae in the floor of North America and worked on um, as an expert in Circeum among others, um, the thistles of, of the nation and the world really. Um, and so, you know, CNPS here, this logo, this really em embodies the chapters and folks like you that are going on plant hikes and documenting more things that may come up later on as being rare that we then have access to, to, to research and, and engage with. So you can't, can't do this in a vacuum. And, you know, Ledyard Stebbins started with just a, looking at MUNs and it, it's grown so much since that time to really have defensible, um, reliable resources and information. So again, here's that pitch to become a status reviewer if you're so inclined, if you're not already a reviewer, I encourage you to sign up. And then I'm gonna go and jump off the presentation here and get into a live demo of 
the inventory. If I can, how do I get out of my, oops. You want to take a couple questions before we start on that, Aaron? Sure, yeah. Um, so the first inventory, I, I loved hearing about the origins because I'm, I'm not sure I ever heard that before. But um, when was the, um, when it was first started, what were some notable, was there sort of a kind of a, what you would expect in that first inventory? Or are there some notables that they first wanted to protect in that inventory? Um, you know, I'd have to look at there. Uh, so actually it, it would be helpful if I get into, um, into my live demo, because I could look at, I can show you how to look at some of the first ones that were ranked. Um, we're actually doing that right now. Um, it's, it's very pertinent that you brought this up. So working with um, Amina Sharma and others in the public affairs team, we're developing these monthly uh, rare, rare plants of the month. And so for this 50th anniversary year, Ellen Dean and Adam Searcy, who are on my team working in the rare plant program, really working on status reviews primarily, um, they're looking at that first list of 526 plants and they're highlighting those as the rare plants of the month for this year. So every rare plant of the month that we see coming out is one that they went through and decided to put up and highlight. And some of those are plants that were presumed extinct that were then later found um, and others you know, that are still just highly rare and endemic that were on that original list. Um, I'm drawing a blank of thinking of like a specific That's one. It's a great uh, thing for the uh, for the demonstration. So, um, and you said there uh, were extinct plants in that first list too, or were those added later? Yeah, there were some that were presumed extinct um, that were then discovered. Um, in one of my presentations, I have a a, a graph that shows the the inventory um, ranks over time, and there was actually a lot more. Um, I want to say there was 30 or nearly 40 plants that were listed as extinct in, in prior inventories or presumed extinct that were since that time rediscovered and newly discovered in new areas or rediscovered that they had thought they'd been ex extinct. So that was re that's really exciting. That list of extinct plants has actually gone down more than it has um, in the past. So that's really good. Excellent. Okay, we'll uh, move on to the next thing then. Thanks. So here's the rare plant inventory. And just before I kind of jump into here, I wanted to highlight since you are a well uh, stocked chapter with Tony Corelli, um, I wanted to show you a resource that you have for your chapter that you may be aware of, but if not, um, is helpful. So I'm just gonna do a general search for CNPS chapters. This is how I kind of navigate things. I'm gonna get here and go to the chapter website of the state uh, website here. And I'm going to zoom in and and get to um, Santa Clara Valley here and click on that. And here I see, here's your chapter and oh, you got a website here. So go ahead and click on that. And here on your chapter page, there is a conservation tab. And within this, there's rare plants. And so Tony has done a fantastic job about documenting the rare plants of the Santa Clara Valley chapter. Here there's a summary of the rare plant inventory, excuse me, for the state. And then down here, there's a summary of the rare plants that are specific to this chapter. And it's really great work she's put together, this whole spreadsheet like list of plants. And um, if you click on a, a photo here, it will take you to a report of the rare plant with a lot of photos. Um, a lot of good just summary information of the habitats here. Um, I love this stature, so you know kind of how what you're looking for here. Um, a lot of photos don't have scales, uh, measuring measurement scales in them, so it's hard to tell what size it is and so forth. And then here, these are actually links um, to additional information. So really cool. I, I recommend you check this out for your local chapter. Um, and then going back to Tony's list here, if you are to click on some of these, so you see that some don't have these um, these links to PDFs with more information, but if you just click on the name, they are linked to the rare plant inventory online and take you to this detail page here. So now I'm gonna back out and go to the homepage of the rare plant inventory and just give you a kind of a brief overview. 
Um, on the homepage, it's really, I recommend people to bookmark it. If you're interested in rare plants, you can see um, what's under review right now. So these two plants are actually on the forum and under review, we're, we're receiving comments. We're hoping to get information, more information about them to, before we add them to the inventory. And then on the other side, we see plants that are recently added or changed pretty much within the past year. Um, and so these are all recent additions or changes, and you can get to the most up-to-date uh, information there. So now I'm going to go to the simple search, and you can get there by either typing simple or up here or down here. Actually, first, I'm going to show you how this, this general search here is also really helpful. If you're kind of blanking on a name, um, you can start typing, and it'll bring in all of the plants. So I just typed in AR and you have everything here. And it also includes common names. So here's our Arborura Ranch Jewel Flower, um, Arctic Meadow Rue. It's a combination of the scientific names and the Latin names. So if you're not sure, or if you just want to search for a specific plant, you can just start it just by typing right in here. So I'm going to jump over to simple search and just click there. Um, this enables multiple criteria searches, but just based on a limited amount of criteria. So here you can search by the rare plant ranks. You can search by basic life form. So if you're only interested in bryophytes, you can click on this. Um, if you're not sure what you're looking for, you know it starts with uh, an N, you can go to here and see the alphabet and click on N and get those names. You can do the same with common names. Um, if you want to know what was added, so to Judy's question, you know, you can actually say what was after what was added after uh, 1974, if you will, for the first inventory, um, but before January 1st of 1975, and you can get the entire list of inventory plants that were added at that time in the first edition. Um, you can also sort by that later, and I'll show you that. So here's the resulting 984. Now, this is less because plants have been reevaluated since that time, less than what was on that print printed list. So now if I go back here, um, I'm going to clear this criteria, and you can search by counties. And so um, Santa Clara is the primary county. You also include most of San Mateo. Um, you can get to it here. So I'm going to go ahead and submit my search for Santa Clara County and just go through kind of what the list looks like. There's 96 matches of rare plants in that, that are known to occur in Santa Clara County. And this can be, you know, it's not wholly up to date with observation records and so forth. So you might be aware of more plants. And that's where, you know, we get that information and update. Um, so here's the full list. And just to show you, this is a scrollable list. You can also um, print this list. So, it, and it really, the idea here is to have it um, look really nice and kind of streamlined with the information for printing for reports and so forth. So you can see here, there's not a lot of gunk and it actually shows up pretty clear. Um, you can export the results and you could do this for an entire, for the entire inventory. Um, Going back, I actually get this question a lot. If you want to search for all the plants, you can just hit search and don't select anything in the search criteria and it'll run through and take a bit and, and get you the full list. Um, so I'm going to pull up this export here of the rare plant inventory uh, search results here just to give you an idea. We're not leaving anything out here. So this is the 98 plants. It's all the data we have on them. It's their blooming periods, it's their federal status, um, rare plant rank status, common names, all of our notes and habitat information, um, the date they were added and so forth. So we don't leave anything out. And then I'm just gonna come back here. And I wanted to show you some of the other navigation uh, tools here. There's been, in the past, there's often requests of like, I wanna have like a, kind of customized results or whatever. I want to be able to modify the results in a way. And so my answer to this was to really work with our rare plant inventory developers in this last version to enable that ability to really modify this page and to get it what you want it to be. So say we just want to print a list and we don't need photos. 
All of these up here are buttons that you can toggle on and off. So if I don't want photos, I just click there and there they go. And I'm gonna try to get my screen here big enough so you guys to see it. So Sam, I don't need to really know when the date it was added. I can just click that off. Um, say I need, I don't really need to know about state or federal list. I can click those off. Um, you can add whatever you want as well. That there's some that are defaulted, not included. So say I want to know microhabitats. I can see um, now all the list of this whether it occurs on serpentine or not are now showing up in these results here. And this information is all available in the export, um, but here, you know, you can look at it and you could print it out if you wanted to. So say I don't need California endemic, I'm gonna turn that off, um, but I kinda wanna have a search image and I wanna look at this. I can turn on habitats and see all the habitats that are listed for, listed in. I can turn on threats and this gets big, but I can get a, a list of all the threats that are, um, that are listed for each plant and and so forth. Um, so I'm going to kind of draw it back here and I'm going to I'm going to take off the uh, the general habitats and say I wanted to print this list, but I really wanted it to get kind of or, more organized. Um, say I want it organized by family. Well, I can just click on the header here and it'll alphabetize by family. Um, what if I want more of a kind of a classic list of listing family first? You can just drag the headers here into whatever organization you want um, to be in. So say I want the rare plant rank to be at the very end, I can just drag it and drop it. Um, and you can sort and so forth as you want. You can also, you know, I wanted it by common name, say I'll just move it over there and I'll alphabetize by common name. So here, say I'm ready to print this list out for uh, Santa Clara County, I can just print this out. And again, you get a nice kind of clean list. And here we have it with the different um, microhabitat information, the soil types and so forth as well, um, just to give you an idea of what you can do. But then I wanted to highlight um, instead of, since I'm giving a live demo, the next part of my presentation is kind of highlighting some of the rare plants that were recently added to um, the rare plant inventory that occur in Santa Clara County. And so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. But actually first I wanna look at advanced search a little bit and show you some of that too. Um, so here advanced search, you have the ability to search by uh, family. So if you just wanted all of the, the monkey flowers, you could do that and so forth. The cool thing about searching in the advanced search is that it has this total matches on the right side. I didn't zoom in here. Oops, well, I'll keep it there so you can see it. So here we see, we immediately know that there's 45 plants in the monkey flower family that are in the inventory and ranked. Um, if I take that off, we see that there's 3,326 plants. This includes rejected plants as well at this time. So say I'm gonna narrow it down to just the ranks. I can just click on those. And here we have the total number is 2,455 plants that are currently um, listed in the inventory. Say I wanna know um, how many of these plants are endemic to the state. I can just go down here to location and click on endemic and we have the total number of endemic plants in California. Moving up, I can search by plants that are seed banked for conservation. Um, all sorts of things, different criteria for rarity, but I'm gonna skip that for now and go further down um, and show you one more new tool in here. Under biology, we now have microhabitats in addition to the general habitats. So say um, I really wanna do narrow this down and um, you can actually, you can search by county here, but you can also move around on a map. You can zoom in and out and you can select them by these nine and, uh, seven and a half minute quadrangles. So I can search down in here and I can get into, um, say I wanted to search in this San Jose area. I can do that just by clicking this quad and in this, in this specific San Jose area, there's eight rare plants that occur. Um, and say I wanted to narrow this down by um, a soil type. So say serpentine is a big one. So let's look at that. Okay, well now there's one rare plant 
in this specific area that is known from serpentine that's rare. Um, and you can then search on your results and see where what it is. And it's leptosiphon, the serpentine leptosiphon. So just to give you an idea of how far you can really narrow it down if you want to, um, I'm going to go ahead and remove uh, serpentine. I do control click and I'm going to um, broaden this. I, I'm going to take this quad off and just go back to Santa Clara County here. So let's see. So here we have 81 rare plants that are ranked and we have an 81 endemic to California. Say I want to get the full list of 98. I just click that off there. Um, and say I wanted to know what's occurring in the county here that might be in bloom that I could go and check out um, this time of year. You can go down here to the bloom time, click on February and view your results of the 13 plants that you may have a chance of seeing in flower. And of course, there's a lot of man's, there are a couple of manzanitas um, and there's other plants that um, specifically shrubs. Um, Vivian mentioned your uh, Jerka field trip coming up. That sounds so cool. I, I still need to see this uh, leatherwood in flower. Um, it sounds like a really great trip. So anyway, I wanted to now focus on some of the newly added plants. Um, unless there's any, I have time for, I think I have time for questions about just kind of searching and navigating if anyone wants to see more of what I did or have any questions. I don't see too many questions about this that specifically right now. Okay. Um, I had some other, couple other general questions that can wait till the end for now. Okay. Um, if anybody else has anything, please put it in the chat. Uh, so I'm going to go back and um, and take off February and look at this 98 list. And I have some of these in my slide presentation, but I just figured I can go through them live and show you here since I'm online. Um, Judy had asked like what plants were on the original list and, you know, that I could highlight maybe. But right now I'm going to focus on what plants are newly added to the list and specifically what occur, occur uh, have at least one known occurrence in um, in Santa Clara County that were added in the last 10 years or so. So one of them I wanted to show you is this Howell's onion. And this plant, um, I'm doing a control click here so I could just open up a new tab. Um, here's what the plant detail pages look like. Um, just to give you an idea of that, there's photos that are linked in Cal, Cal photos, and then you have links to Cal flora. We'll take you right to the Cal flora record. Um, links to the e floor, which take you to the e floor where you can actually get to the key. Um, so you can learn how to key out this, this rare allium if you'd like. Um, there's also this report. You can download a PDF report. Um, I showed you Tony's report. This is our version um, for the inventory. It includes a rundown. It's not as succinct as um, Tony's single page reports, but it includes all the information on the details page, but in a PDF form um, and so forth. Going back here, some of the um, information I wanted to highlight about this one is that it's uh, the many, our notes say that many of the occurrences are historical. It needs field work. And it really is only eking into Santa Clara County. And it's based on a 19, I believe 36 uh, voucher record. So I'll talk about that a little bit if I have time in my presentation. But this one came up to my mind as being like, well, is it really in this county? Um, it'd be good to get eyes on the ground and see if it really occurs here. It is a watch list plan. It's just a rank four. Um, but based on that historical significance, it's really a locally rare significant plant if it actually did occur in the county and may be extirpated from Santa Clara County. So it's one that it's important to figure out. And that's why I'm highlighting it for you all tonight as something to look out for this onion. Um, here below, you see its full distribution in a, um, in a quad map. And we don't display detailed occurrence records. You can get that from the Consortium, Calif uh, Consortium of California Herbaria or from Cal Flora or an iNaturalist, but um, we provide just this general information because these are based on a lot more data and verified records than the um, other public data sets. 
Down here at the bottom, we have um, the status review documents. So you can actually see the review document that I published with Caitlin Green and Roxanne back in 2017 that summarizes the information um, that really went into this inventory. So just to show you the kind of the resources here on the details page. And coming back to the top, the next plant I wanted to highlight that has been added somewhat recently. Um, I'll kind of leave it to, at this one for now. This Bokra rubicundula is was added by me in 2011. And it is one of our OKO plants. By OKO, I mean one known occurrence. Um, this plant is ranked at our highest rank possible or highest conservation rank, 1B1, the point one being threatened um, with 80% of or more of its occurrences under threat. And that's just because it's known from the single occurrence. Um, and it is um, only known from a type collection on Mount Day. So I don't know. I believe that people have probably been botanizing on Mount Day since this time. It was, I think, I want to say in the 1930s, and it hasn't been seen since. So if anyone sees a Bokhara, which is in the Brassicaceae, um, the mustard family, if anyone comes across um, a plant like this, and I, I, there's no photos of it, I did... Um, highlight some of the similar species. I'll go back to my presentation. I'll show you some photos of these similar species. Um, if anyone finds a Bokhara on Mount Day, take really good photos and try to get back and get permission to collect it and make a voucher collection, unless it's the only one present, because we really need to know and find out if this um, plant is extant or not. Um, it probably, it might need to be re-ranked to 1A, which is our presumed extinct category, um, having not been seen since the 30s. And um, these are really difficult to identify. And I will say that it is described based on these type specimen. So there's not a lot of information to go from here. You know, it, it could be questionable whether it's, um, you know, a unique taxon, but the Michael Windham, the expert in, in Bokura says it's a unique um, a unique plant and, and described it back in 2007. So there you have it for this one. And I will jump off back into my presentation. And I'll be able to show you some photos of the similar, similar plant to this one. Let's see, actually, if I do my presentation here. So back to the inventory. Um, after that search, there is a, at the bottom here, I just wanted to point out if you, if anyone wants more information, how to search or questions about it or how to submit data and so forth, you can email us at rareplants at cmps.org. This includes a few rare plant program staff who can help answer questions and so forth. Got that down. And before moving on, I wanted to, put a shout out to the supporters of this version of the online inventory. Um, I'd mentioned previously in my talk that it could, you know, was updated every four to six years from the print editions. Then it was every quarter, which was huge. Then it was every month with a huge leap. Now we can make instant updates. So someone gives us an update in elevation or a threat rank change, we can go in there and make that change immediately. And it just goes live online. It's really easy to make changes and easy to update and maintain. And John Donahue, who's um, now with uh, Independent, was really the mastermind behind this development, and Andrew Walter, who's a database developer. Um, the most funding we got for this was from the Forest Service um, to redevelop this database. And we got money from the state of California through the Center for Plant Conservation for um, our California Plant Rescue Initiative, which are to collect the rare plant seeds for all 1B rare plants in the state of California for long-term conservation and ex situ conservation. And then we had additional contributions from all of these um, cons mostly consulting firms that I really wanted to thank um, that really got us to where we are today with that online version that I just showed you. We're continuing to advance it. So these I mentioned, one of them I didn't mention um, in my live demo that was a recent addition. This was just added last year. 
it barely ekes into the uh, your all's chapter here. It's mostly on the coast over here, and it is a former Orobanki. They're now known as Aphilons or Aphilons. Um, you say it however you want. <laughs> and it is a 1v1. It has 13 occurrences, but almost half of them are historical. So almost half of them are haven't been seen. And and this one up here uh, in the north northern portion of San Mateo County hasn't been seen in over 20 years. So that's one that I want you all to, to look for. Um, its only confirmed host is lizard tail. So that gives you a really good search image. Um, as with all Orobanki aphalons, they could be fleeting. They might not be up for several years. Um, so this one could be more probably has more records than the 13 we know about. And so we really want to get um, people's eyes on the ground out looking for it and to encourage you all to, to go out and seek it out. Here's the allium I mentioned. Here's some photos more up close. And you can see as a list four, a rank four plant, um, this is that record I was talking about, the Southern Santa Clara Valley Santa Clara uh, County record that hasn't been seen um, since 1937 based on a voucher collection. So is it still there? Is it even in the county? Um, this is of local significance. It's disjunct from other records. Um, it'd be really good to know. The vague location is Santa Clara County, eight miles southeast of Gilroy Road and to Halster. So you all probably know more about that. Um, vicinity of that area. I only know it from how we want to want and passing through, but um, yeah, something to, to keep a lookout for. It's a lot of farmland out there, so. Yeah, and that's the thing, it, you know, it, it, it could be extirpated there, but there's hope. There's still, sometimes you find little pockets of native plants, and little gems. Here's the Mount Day rock crest that I mentioned. Um, this is a similar plant. So there's no live photos of this plant. Um, it's only known from that herbarium record from way back in the day. And this is from uh, a photo of, of Bokura Brewery, which is very similar, um, that actually does co-occur where on Mount Day. So this would be the most similar thing that you'd find probably out there. But still, there's only not so many records on Mount Day, so it's really good to get more, more information about it. So keep an eye out for this, for this plant. Here's some close-ups of this brewer eye, subspecies brewer, brewer eye, to give you an idea. Again, this was added in 2011. It's one of our one known occurrence plants in this in the world, one known occurrence in the entire world. Um, and you all have it at Mount Day, hopefully. So that that Cal Flora says it was last seen in 1908. Is that the case? Yes. Here's my slide. Okay. It was described. It was described from a voucher, the type locality in 1908. Um, and who knows? There's surprisingly not a lot of records of Bokras from Mount Day, and the only other Bokra known from Mount Day is that um, this similar tax on this brewery. So. You know, this could be, this happens that plants get described from herbarium records and then are known or extinct. Um, the Cunningham, Cunningham Marsh um, Castilea is one plant that I remember ranking that got dis formally described after it went extinct, which is really unfortunate. Um, but that's one of the importance of making voucher collections um, for herbaria is because we wouldn't have known about the diversity of our state as much if we don't have these records to look back on and have experts look at them and say, actually, this is something different. And now um, they can even extract DNA. Every year it gets better and better to extract DNA from voucher specimens to actually do those studies and determine that they're gene genetically significant and, and different as well. So um, that's another thing we do as botanists to make voucher collections. Um, you can't extract DNA from a photo. So just wanted to put a it picture just there. Also pointed out in the comments um, that Mount Day area is part of the Hamilton range. It's completely private ranches back there. There's almost no public land or accessible uh, land. So we make friends with our, we have some rancher friends out there, but it's pretty hard to get to. Um, yeah. and a lot of times we rely a lot on the 
Helen Sharsmith's list from her PhD research back in the 30s. She saw a lot of plants. Huh. We haven't seen a lot since, and she she lists two arabesques, but not this one. So yeah, brewer eye. Yeah, and listing brewer eye since this was described in 2007, what she saw could have been this rare plant. You know, we don't know. Because it had nothing else to, you know, you shoehorn it into like the most similar thing. And um, anyway, and it, it is um, distinct according to Wyndham, but it is very, you know, these are can be difficult to ID. And they they do look at a lot of hairs and pubescence too, which is hard to, to discern. So maybe, you know, based on this one voucher from way in the past, maybe it was a unique genetic mutation that didn't survive. It's hard to say. That's what we deal with often with these extinct plants or presumed extinct plants is like, we can't go back and collect more to really know for sure. But we have this voucher from 1908 that the experts say is unique and they've, they have they say it's keyable and provide the keys and how to key it out. And um, it's just our job to keep an eye out for it. It'd be really, really fun to explore that area again. Yeah. And it's good to know that, you know, some of the ranch ranchers out there and, um, be great to just kind of try to get more access to go out there and see some plants. Now I have a little section that I call why conserve rare species and I have this growing list and I look for you all to have more reasons. When I gave my first presentation to CNPS when I first started back in 2010, I was shocked and dismayed, dismayed and really odd by the question I got after my presentation, I was presenting on the new inventory that just got released, the 2010 uh, 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 eighth edition that I talked about a little bit tonight. Um, at the end of my presentation, I didn't have, you know, I was focused so much on the database and all the new cool features and stuff. And someone asked me, why should I care? Why should I care about rare plants? You showed me this cool database, all this stuff, how to search for them, but who, what gives? What's the point, you know? <laughs> And I was like, how could anyone feel this way? But I come from, you know, it's just doing this work and having this passion and and working, you know, in this in this realm is like, it's obvious to me, right? And it's obvious to my colleagues and the people I work with. But it's true that, you know, we have to be able to provide that justification information to people that may not care or know about rare plants. And so it, it really is a valid question, but I didn't know how to answer it back then when I first started, because I was mostly because I was in shock. I was like, why not? Are you kidding me? Um, but here's some of the things that uh, the highlights that I, you know, focus on for for that. And so when I mentioned um, the um, J.P. Smith quotes about uh, saving rare plants equals saving places, so that's a really a big one. Um, with this this nexus of California Environmental Quality Act um, and the way the legislation is set up, we can really um, utilize rare plants for helping to protect areas. And obviously, you know, without the, the habitat, the rare plants won't survive either. So it's really, it can be difficult to, to protect habitat with our legislation. Um, and so utilizing the rare plant uh, designations to help pr protect that habitat in turn can help protect rare plants and other native taxa. They contribute to biodiversity, obviously. Um, they're all unique species and taxa that deserve to be, uh, that have evolved and coexist and should be, contribute to our biodiversity and our pollinators. They play key ecological roles. At, many times we don't even know the ecological roles that they play, um, which is important to emphasize if they were to be lost, we would lose out on things we we're not even aware. Um, and that has a trickle and cascading effect. They have evolutionary significance. They may provide medic medicinal uses. Um, there's so much unknown about our rare plants and so much this lack of study about rare plants that it could be possible. They're protected by legal regulations. They're target for conservation planning. So this is more of like the requirements of, you know, why you should care. Um, as I mentioned previously, they can help protect other organisms. So protecting rare plants can protect their pollinators and um, other key um, key organisms that contribute to the biodiversity. And they should be of one's eth 
uh, environmental ethics and morals, at least they are for me, um, you know, when I, when I'm aware of plants that are going extirpated at local levels or extinct globally, um, this does happen and has happened in the past naturally through stochastic events, volcanic eruptions and so forth. But what we're seeing today um, in the face of, of rare plants through climate change and through the um, pervasive human impacts, really the extirpations and extinctions we're seeing today are human caused. And that just, to me, you know, if we could, if we sit back and watch this happen, know that we're the cause of it, we got to do something about it. I can't sit back and just let it happen. I got to, I got to shout out and do what I can. Um, and I put it all on you as well to do what you can to help protect these plants. They have no voice other than ours to help protect them. And they deserve to live just as much as other organisms deserve to live. And they are very beautiful. Uh, Michael Soleil, uh, who's known as the father of conservation biology, um, mentioned four conservation principles to live by. The diversity of organisms is important and the ecological complexity of, of those organisms. They function evolutionary processes, uh, many of which we don't know, but as you lose some, you lose those processes and it has um, that trickling effect. And the one that I really, you know, hits me is that biodiversity has intrinsic value irrespective of its usefulness to people. So, you know, who are we to be the ones that decide and we are the ones that decide what goes uh, extinct and what survives in a way. And um, and really, it, it these plants have value, irrespective of what kind of value we can find or usefulness or resource we can find from them, right? And one way to describe um, ecosystems and biodiversity and 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 what's being lost is that. Um, if we lose species at a high rate, it weakens ecosystems. And if you compare it to a Jenga tower, for instance, um, you could remove a few blocks, the tower still remains standing, but it gets weakened every time you remove one of those pieces. And if we intentionally let one species go extinct, what about the others that are next? So, um, you know, in relation to the tiny annual plant that's known from one postage stamp, we don't know what its pollinators are. We don't know what it does for, for us or other organisms in the environment. Um, but if we let that go extinct, then where do we draw that line for other organisms and we keep letting more species go extinct? I hope not. So we must protect at some level to prevent the slow rate, or prevent the rate of extinction or slow it down. And I'm gonna leave you with tonight with um, one last quote from Ledger Stebbins, the founder of the Rare Plant Program and the past president for uh, many years and one of the founders of really the organization. Um, back in 1990, um, which was 25 years after CMPS was founded, um, and now, you know, nearly uh, 60 years ago since the CMPS was founded, this quote still rings true to me to this day. Um, he said, we are well established and growing at a rate that is commensurate with our needs. No matter how big we become, we must maintain the intimacy, friendliness, and capacity for doing things ourselves that we have nurtured in the past. Continuous field experience, supplemented by exchange of opinions, has been and will be our lifeblood. As we grow, these qualities can be directed towards ever-expanding goals and prospects of conservation. We should welcome visitors, nurture alliances, and do everything possible to promote our role as a relatively small but effective unit in a worldwide federation of societies dedicated to the cause of saving beauties of plant life from destruction. And with that, I want to thank you all very much and thank my wonderful wife and my kids for putting up with me some of these past summers to collect seeds and do rare plant surveys when, when I do get out into the field. and. Um, the late Dean Taylor, who was a mentor and really putting a fire under all rare plant botanists to, to, to be objective and to do their work. And the rare plant um, development team for the new inventory and um, my dear friends and colleagues, Julie Kierstead and Keith Bartosh, as well as the uh, senior to be staff, the past staff, Roxanne and Christy and current staff, Jennifer and, and Katie, 
um, Ellen Dean and the CNPS botanists in the past and the countless hundreds of volunteers and status reviewers. And this really, the, the chapters of CNPS that have really got us to where we are today with this inventory and its development. And with that, I will leave it to questions. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Aaron. Thanks so much for such a thorough and, I mean, I thought I knew the rare plant program a little bit, but I definitely learned more with this. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. We have a, several questions, um, both here and on YouTube. So um, first off, where is San Luis Island? You had seen that in uh, Dr. Smith or Mr. Smith's you know, list. I, I don't know that one. <laughs> I was wondering that as well. I just got that quote a few days ago and I would have to look it up. I don't know. Uh, it's interesting. Um, yeah. So uh, the exactly. question, how will the seed strategy for ecological restoration support increasing rare plants? Um, so the seed strategy that CMPS just helped to develop through a lot of collaboration um, I believe it should. It's really it's focused on um, restoration efforts and getting bulk seed collections. And what we've what we really need and what can help with rare plants is planting locals, planting more local native um, stock in areas instead of introducing nursery plants from out of other areas. And what that can do is help um, keep the native gene pool native, which can have effect on rare plants if they are, you know, happen to be planted for restoration projects and they are from a different area, they might have competition, they might cross in uh, in genes through pollinators and so forth. So that seed strategy, yes, it, it ultimately helps the ecosystems overall. The other um, important initiative going on right now with California Plant Rescue, and I'll, I'll share this since I, I actually can't figure out how to stop sharing my screen, so I'll just keep sharing. We can um, uh, we can do that for you. So the caplantrescue.org is um, an initiative that was founded in 2014 that CMPS and I started to be uh, included on from the ground up. It's a collaborative of 11 institutions with CNPS being one of them, technically not an institution, but we're collecting, our goal is to collect the um, rare plant seeds from all 1B plants, so all the most rare threatened or endangered plants in California. And um, we have gotten through over 75% of those at this date. And those these seeds are going to be put into long-term storage, so deep freeze, and they're also, you know, with the goal of ex situ conservation for developing new occurrences or augmenting populations that are in need of help. They can also be used for research, such as like population genetic research and so forth. Um, but a lot of shout out to these institutions and partners. Um, right here's uh, the members of this coalition here. So this one really is focused on on just rarities. Great. Um, well, thank you for that. I know it's a big promotion right now by CMPS um, about the seed strategy. Mm -hmm. well, um, good. Okay, so a uh, question from email. I noticed on the Center for Plant Conservation website that seed collection of rare species is sometimes done. Where the out Where is the outcome of the seed collection documented? And what is the fate of the plants grown from this seed? I would like to hear about a particular example of possible, if possible, a Fritillaria purdii. Well, Fritillaria purdii is on my background here on my desktop computer, my laptop actually. Um, Do you I, want to stop sharing? Do you want to stop I, sharing? No, I, um, that's fine. I okay. can show, I can keep the, the website open and show some things. So, so here's Fritillaria purdii. I actually collected the seeds of this plant, and um, in my uh, presentation, uh, my last slide here, Toby, my my son, um, actually helped me on that same day. He was collecting a Fritillaria in that one, but he uh, or a, a different one, Erythronium that day. But he actually collect helped me collect the seeds of this rare Fritillaria purdii. And 
when we do this work for the Center for Plant Conservation, it's really that coalition coalition of um, of entities that I shared um, of all these other institutions. So, oops, about and the mission. Um, if you go here, you can learn more, but I'll just mention it right now. So the seeds that that I collected from that rare fritillaria um, go to, in this case, we sent them to the California Botanic Garden for their long-term seed storage. So some of these institutions are, are vetted to have long-term seed storage with freezer backups and so forth. And CMPS mostly works with the California Botanic Garden to submit our seeds there. And when I collected that, when we collect for this for this work, we collect maternal lines. So we collect and keep um, seeds in individual bags. And we use these coin envelopes that you see it. Um, my son here holding these little coin envelopes if I make this bigger. Um, these are all these number one small coin envelopes. We typically, those are big enough for most plants. We pack the seeds in these individual envelopes and label them for each individual plant. Our goal is to get at least 50 plants, seeds from at least 50 plants and at least 3000 seeds if we can. For the, for the rare fritillaria, I wasn't able to get that many seeds. Um, there just wasn't enough plants of that population, but we get as much as we can without harming the population. And we don't collect more than 5% of the seed produced. Um, with that, the bar, the garden goes through and whoever re receives the seeds goes through and they curate them and they put them in long-term storage and deep freeze. And <clears throat> they set aside some of the bulk collection to do viability testing. Um, so they set aside seeds from each individual packet to use for bulk testing to make sure that the seeds are viable. And in time, they will also outplant some of these seeds to keep the, the collection going. So seeds will lose viability even in deep freeze over time. And some it, it varies greatly by the type of species, um, but some, but they can last for a long time, 50 years or so forth or more. But depending on the plant, they have to take that out of storage, grow it in the garden, have it produce more seed, and then take that seed and put it back into storage. So the idea is to have that seed for perpetuity, to just keep doing that so we always have viable seed. Um, at that point, you know, if a research scientist or someone wants to do a study on the fritillaria perdii, they can contact the California Botanic Garden and see if they can obtain some of the seeds that I collected for this project to use specifically for projects. Um, if there's enough seed, it can be given for that type of research. It can also be used for for doing restoration type work. Um, ex situ conservation is planting new populations of rare plants for to help um, in crisis times. So in climate change, if the distribution needs to be, you know, is changing because of the new climate regime, the idea is to do this ex situ conservation where we might have the means of actually planting in areas where it can survive to keep the populations going. Um, of course, that brings up a lot of questions of, you know, the mycorrhiza that's associated with the plants and the pollinators and so forth. But it's kind of the best thing we can do at this time to try to at least have this kind of backup um, scenario for conservation. Do seeds ever go to the National Seed Bank in Fort Collins? Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Every collection, so a, a portion of my collection, actually half of it goes to Fort Collins. And the other institutions put it in that in that national collection as another backup. So you're not keeping all of your eggs in one basket, if you will. Um, if there were to be a fire or something in the and devastating an institution or whatever it will, it's in, a, in another area um, being backed up. Great. Uh, here's a specific question about our area. Um, it has a Sidalsia hickmani ever been collected in San Mateo County. It came up in the Cypress Grove after the CZU fire. I think that was... Sedalsia hickmanii, I do know the name of the plant. I don't know that I've ever seen it. Um, I don't know. Interesting. I don't know one, of the, one of the things about having this job, and I'm not spelling it right. Um, one of the things about being the rare plant botanist or the director of rare plant program is that um, really we rely a lot on the local knowledge of people because we cover the whole entire state. So 
my mind could be set in like San Diego or Modoc when we're ranking a plant up there. Um, I can't go, we can't, we don't have the resources to go everywhere and to see the, the plants often. So we rely on people um, to go out there and get the information and help us out. So that would be something that I'd like to ask Tony Corelli about and others that are you know more local to your area to be able to give us that insight. I'd have to research it. With, so a good place if you wanted to research whether a plant's been seen in our area, you're talking about the, uh, the herbarium collections. First of all, what would be the first? You, would you look first in the rare plant inventory to see where it the collections may be? Yeah, so you can start there. So if I do a... If I do a search of Sedalcia hickmanii in the inventory and I bring it back up here, um, we do have a lot of subspecies. So I want to know which which one. Um, there's Marin, Parishes, Hickmans. I could just do the Hickman one for now as an example. Um, Paul, if you want to say anything about this, you're welcome. So Hickman's actually occurs in this area and it could be the one that you're, that might've been showing up, but I'm not sure it's further south. Yeah. So um, one thing. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, go on. I, I'm the one who went over there. Uh, this was actually discovered by um, another two botanists who went in there and uh, they were looking at the um, cypress coming back Oh, okay. And they noticed this thing, what's this plant? And they keyed it as Hickman eye. We don't have it to what the subspecies is. I was able to get in there with the county and take a look, and it was all over the place. And we had never seen it there before. Wow. Um, and yeah. it, there, yeah. there is no record in the county that I can find. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's that's significant, especially there's so many rare subspecies of this. Yeah. Salvia. Um, and it would be good to, if you have permission to collect it and get it to someone, you know, that could key it to subspecies. Um, if you hear, if you go here to the inventory, you know, some of the links that Judy was mentioning and that I mentioned before, um, the eFlora is one of them that will get you to the dichotomous key um, back there. But then there's also within here, um, there's the CCH records. And so this links to the um, CCH1, the Consortium of California Herbaria. These are the most verifiable records because they're actually dead plants sitting in herbarium. You can go and look at them. You can mm -hmm. actually get an expert in there. And so a lot of these for Hickmanii, they're at Cal Academy. This is the CAS. Um, you know, so it'd be the kind of thing if we did pull up a record from the past, um, we could coordinate with someone that's a curator at the herbarium where it's housed and say, hey, could you take a look at this? We just found it, you know, and that kind of thing. So that's that's one thing we do often in the rare plant program when there's a new discovery of a new record, really getting to the bottom of it, make sure it's, you know, validly identified. Um, you know, there's there's a place to start in the inventory. Often people start in Cal Flora because that can get you to a lot of these links as well and gives you more of that like specific location data. Yeah. Okay. The, the uh, location is not easy to get to, and it is in a county park, so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, That's I mean, exciting. county parks are like, they're, they're I want to say easy, but typically in like county, it's pretty straightforward to get collecting permits. Um, but I, you know, photo documentation. Okay. I have a photo. <laughs> a lot of them, you know, the, uh, you want to get the, um, the leaves are really important you know the overall habit the leaves the underside of the uh, sepals and the petals because the flowers themselves uh, not too distinct as far as i recall um for this particular genus but um these calices mm -hmm. and the hairs the distance between the, the flowers and the leaves are really important um so here you see, you know, the uh, there's a bract here that's in this photo. That's really good character to get um, as well. It's that bract. So here you see someone took a photo where you can see these bracts under the inflorescences. These yep. are distinctive in Stelsius. You can get photos of that. It's a really good character. 
and as close as you can to some of these hairs as well um, on the leaves and the stems and so forth. That's good. It's it's exciting that we're still discovering new things. I got it. Yeah, the fire's a bit like I mean, you know, it's it's devastating in in a lot of cases, but also for plants, it's it's really great in a way to open up more habitat and to allow species like the sedalcia that have like had this dormant seed bank in that area probably for decades and have now be able to open up, get some sunshine, get the nutrients from the charcoal and everything else to start growing. Um, I got a couple more questions on YouTube, uh -huh. so I'm going to move on to those. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Um, so, let's see. Does legal protection of species extend to the subspecies and variety level? Yes, it does. So the first, um, the first rare plant inventory that Stebbins created, he really focused on at the species level, but it soon became um, built out into subspecies and varieties. So the environmental law um, protects plants at the taxon level, so down to the variety in the subspecies. Great. Um, do the results of the DNA analysis for rare plants go into a central database anywhere? There is a, um, well, it varies as far as how many rare plants have DNA, you know, extracted and, and available. Um, but there is GenBank that is a, I think it's mostly like an academic database for obtaining um, genetic information for, for plants. And the genetics part of things is kind of more out, outside of my realm. I have an expert on staff or a couple experts on staff that are geneticists. Um, that really helped me <laughs> you know, find that information. Um, but yeah, for a lot of rare plants, they're just described morpho morphologically and uh, morphometrics are really important. And sometimes um, a lot of what's actually interesting is that um, while a lot of the plants that may have been questionable as being described have panned out to be distinct based on the genetics, which is exciting to find and hear about. Yes. Good. I think that's all we have right now. Um, unless anyone else has a question, uh, put it in the chat. Okay. Uh, someone has said, just jumped in here. What genetics work would be most valuable? I'm not exactly sure. Uh, well, it, first... Yeah. Um, so, so Doug Stone, who's on staff right now, is a is a, a researcher geneticist that's that's working in the rare plant program, and he's evaluating our list three plants, and um, a lot of these plants we're working on actively removing ones that are just some of the plants on this list actually just have distribution questions but we now can figure that out through this consortium of herbaria and calflora and iNaturalist and so forth so those we're working on re, you know evaluating but there's still remaining ones that need genetic study to really make to really determine out and so um this is a great starting list and doug um we're working on more He's actually reviewed this list of 71 plants that are on list three and is actively working on reviewing them. And um, some of them he's gathering DNA for right now are the mouse tails, uh, myosurus. So right now he's working on getting samples throughout the Great Valley um, and wherever this plant occurs in California. Let me see, I got to scroll down to myosurus. Um, so this is one that is actively being worked on this year, the little mouse tails. And um, it's a vernal pool plant. And I will see there could be, just because we don't have photos in the inventory, just means that they haven't been linked yet. Um, so here's what it looks like. And this one we're sampling, we're collecting whole plants or inflorescence or leaves into those coin envelopes and putting those into silica bead um, gel, very fine silica the GC gel into a, a plastic Ziploc bag, and then um, folks are mailing them to to Doug. And so anyone that is able to help with do this, get a, get um, in touch with Doug Stone, dstone at cnps.org. And he has a better pulse on like what plants need the, um, the genetic work right now, but this is one he's actively working on. And he will mail out packets and instructions for collections. So he's bought like bulk silica gel He'll mail you the packet, some envelopes, and you can get started if you're interested in helping to collect some samples. Collecting legally, of course. Um, yes. 
<laughs> following CNPS guide policy. Yeah. So that's great. Um, it's so much going on right now. It's just hard to hard to track it all. But if people have questions, they should contact you at asims at cnps.org, right? That's Yeah. And also, um, I, I have a, a backlog of email too. If you you probably could get a more immediate result too by contacting us at rareplants at cnps.org. Okay. That has Alan, myself, Kristen Nelson, um, Caitlin Green are all in there kind of helping to, to answer questions and so forth. But feel free to reach out to me directly to uh, asims at cnps.org. I think we all have a backlog of email, so. <laughs> yeah, it's not intentional if you don't hear back from me. Um, I also, you know, just, don't give up. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll respond eventually. And if if you need immediate attention, you know, look for my uh, work number and I can and call me up. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, for spending time with us. I think it's almost nine o'clock and uh, I think people have run out of questions for the moment. So all right, well, thank you so much. It's been great to talk to you all. I wish I could see you all in person. But Yeah, well, uh, soon, I hope so. Um, yeah. Anyway, Vivian, do you want to uh, wrap it up? I just wanted to thank Aaron again. Thank you so much, Aaron. This was a really great presentation. And like Judy, I thought I knew a fair amount about the rare plant program, but I learned quite a bit tonight. So really, really appreciate the time. And of course, now we have it on record so other people can come in and, and review too. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you so much. It's been a, a pretty long evening and I know you've been under the weather, so I again really appreciate that you're oh, i'm here so today. happy to be here and i thank you all for listening and please reach out and keep in touch and uh thanks, thanks everybody for their questions and participation appreciate that all right thanks everybody we'll okay, see have you a good at night. the next one good night and i am now ending the session <laughs>